Maybe you're listening to this podcast on your commute to work, or in your kitchen while you're doing the dishes, or maybe on a walk outside enjoying the spring weather. Wherever you are, though, one thing is certain. Whether or not you know it, you are being bombarded with particles from outer space. We call these particles cosmic rays, and although physicists have known about these particles for more than a century, there's still a lot about them that remains a mystery. In today's episode, we'll talk about what these cosmic rays are, where they're reaching us from, and what they can tell us about what's out there in the extragalactic universe. This episode of Why This Universe is supported by Wondrium. Wondrium is a mind-blowing subscription service that offers thousands of video and audio courses on a huge range of topics. I've been a big fan and regular consumer of Wondrium's content for the past 15 years or so, and over that time I've listened to dozens of their courses on subjects including history, philosophy, literature, math, and science. For me, it's like taking an intro-level university course from a great professor on a subject you've always wanted to know more about, but without the big tuition fee and all in the comfort of your own home or daily commute. One of my favorite courses offered by Wondrium is called Redefining Reality. Over 36 lectures, this course explores some of the biggest picture questions in all of human thought, spanning not only physics and other branches of science, but also the metaphysics and philosophy that underpins it. In this course, you'll explore questions like, are atoms real, or can they even be said to be real? Or can the physics of quantum mechanics somehow help us to explain the phenomena we call consciousness? So if you want to learn about some of these deep questions at the heart of our understanding of reality, give this course a try. You can sign up for Wondrium now through our special URL to get a free month of unlimited access. Just go to wondrium.com universe. That's W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot com slash U-N-I-V-E-R-S-E. You're listening to Why This Universe, a podcast where we break down the biggest ideas in physics. My name is Shalma, and I'm a PhD student at NYU. And I'm Dan Hooper. I'm a theoretical astrophysicist at Fermilab and at the University of Chicago. Today on our show, we're talking about cosmic rays, mysterious travelers that hit us from the vast reaches of outer space. But we're going to start our episode by going back to the beginning and asking how is it that physicists came to discover these invisible particles in the first place? In the early years of the 20th century, physicists had begun to notice that there was a pretty high level of radioactivity around the Earth's surface. Like if you just took some sort of device to measure it, you know, it was a lot higher than you might have guessed. And I think quite reasonably, the scientists at the time assumed this was coming from the Earth itself. After all, there are a lot of known isotopes that are radioactive and lots of which are found pretty commonly in the Earth's crust. So that, that just seemed like a, a very plausible story. But then in 1911, that whole conclusion, that whole picture was turned on its head by the pioneering work of this Austrian physicist named Victor Hess. What Hess did that hadn't been done before is he didn't just measure the levels of radioactivity on the Earth's surface. He went and measured those radioactivity levels using high altitude balloons. So he put himself in this balloon or a series of balloons and went you know, kilometers above the Earth's surface and measured the amount of radioactivity there. So like, I wanna emphasize, like, this was a pretty daring thing to do in the early 1900s. Like ballooning was still pretty dangerous. So like this was scientifically important, but it's also this like kind of daring adventurer kind of side of, of, of science, which you don't hear about that much anymore. Yeah, kind of like pre-institutionalized version of the science maybe. Yeah. It's hard to say now what exactly Hess was looking for when he got on that balloon. But what he saw was that the radioactivity changed as he ascended higher and higher into the atmosphere. At first, it behaved the way you might expect. It dropped off a little bit as he went a kilometer or so above the Earth's surface. But then it started going up again as he went higher and higher and higher. So the highest flight he took back then was 5.3 kilometers above the Earth's surface. And by then, you know, the radioactivity had gotten, you know, twice as high as it was at sea level. That's not what you would expect if the radioactivity was coming from the Earth. 
So originally, a lot of scientists were pretty skeptical of Hess's results. It just you know, seemed very unlikely that the radioactivity would be coming from somewhere other than the Earth. Um, but within a few years, a bunch of other scientists, or at least a few of them, did similar experiments and got similar results. So it quickly became pretty clear that the farther you went up in the atmosphere, the, the higher these levels of radioactivity became. And they were left with really no way to interpret this data than to conclude that this radioactivity wasn't coming from the Earth. It's high energy particles that are bombarding the Earth from space in all directions. And we call these things now cosmic rays, and they were a huge mystery then, and I would argue they're still a pretty big mystery today. To understand what this discovery felt like at the time, you have to remember that we knew a lot less about the universe in 1911 than we do today. The science of cosmology, which studies the evolution of the universe from the Big Bang, hadn't even been invented yet. We didn't even understand our own sun. And we didn't know that there were other galaxies out there outside of the Milky Way. We knew a lot about, you know, our solar system and the planets and things like that. But everything we knew was really based on like optical astronomy. So, you know, mirrors and lenses collecting light and giving us a picture of what we saw out there. I would say uh, it was all very primitive by modern standards. All right, so before we go any further with the story of cosmic rays, I think we should probably clarify a little bit of the terminology that we're using here. Um, when some people hear the word radiation, they might think of something mysterious or maybe scary or dangerous. But when a scientist uses this word, this word radiation, all they really mean are, are fast moving particles, like ordinary particles like protons, electrons, or maybe nuclei, photons, any of these things can be radiation. Um, even sunlight is radiation. So radiation isn't intrinsically scary or mysterious. In large doses, it can be harmful, of course, but that's true about almost everything. Just radiation is just a very ordinary part of everyday life. Now, when it comes to the kind of radiation that Hess and others were detecting, these were particles that have enough energy to break electrons off of atoms. We call this ionizing radiation. Light in the form of gamma rays or X-rays or ultraviolet right light can all be ionizing radiation. And so can electrons and protons or nuclei as long as they're moving fast enough. On the surface of the Earth, most of the ionizing radiation we experience comes from things that contain unstable atoms or, or radioactive atoms. Uh, radon, for example, is a, a common form of ionizing radiation. And radon's found in, in gases that naturally seep out of bedrock. It's a, just a very naturally occurring thing. And, and those can be dangerous if your house isn't you know, well ventilated or something. But there are lots of other like everyday objects that are radioactive. Um, some of my favorite examples are Brazil nuts and bananas, um, which contain potassium-40. So if you bring a, a banana near a, a, de a detector of radiation, it will start lighting up like a Christmas tree. And you know that doesn't mean bananas are dangerous. It just means they have potassium, which is good for you, but also a little radioactive. Okay, so back to cosmic rays. Over the years and decades, it was figured out that most of these cosmic rays are actually protons. About 90% of them are protons. The remaining 10% are, about nine of those 10% are helium nuclei, also called alpha particles. And then the remaining 1% are other kinds of nuclei. Um, and then there's a tiny smattering thrown in of things like electrons and even particles of antimatter, like positrons or antiprotons, things like that. There's also these exotic particles called muons that are raining down on Earth from um, cosmic radiation. Uh, muons are kind of like electrons, but they're unstable and they're much heavier. Um, but muons don't live for very long. They, they decay in about a millionth of a second. So there's no way the muons are coming from a, you know, distant remote astrophysical objects. They just don't live long enough to do that. Instead, the muons are being created when other cosmic rays hit the Earth's atmosphere and in those collisions, muons are created. So either way, we're being bombarded with a rain of muons every moment of every day, but all being told, though, those muons don't originate from astrophysical sources. This cosmic radiation is all over. In every square meter area on Earth, a few thousand protons from space will hit every second. But like Dan said, it's nothing to worry about. In my coffee cup, there are also 10 to the 25 protons. So like it's a small number of net protons, but these protons have a lot of energy, so you can detect them a lot easier. They're a lot more obvious than the you know, protons that make up my coffee. 
most of these cosmic rays that were discovered by Hess and others were pretty energetic, but not super energetic. They had about a GeV or a giga electron volt of energy. At, at this sort of energy, these, these particles are moving at like a substantial fraction of the speed of light, but they're not moving at 99.999% of the speed of light. They're, you know, maybe they're moving at half or 90% of the speed of light, something like that. There are like 10,000 of these per square meter per second hitting the earth. But it turns out there's also a small fraction of the cosmic rays that have a lot more energy. If instead of waiting one second, we waited about a day, there's pretty good, pretty good chance that one cosmic ray will strike our square meter that has about 10,000 times more energy than average, or about uh, 10,000 giga electron volts, or if you prefer 10 TeV or tera electron volts. Now, this is about as much energy as the protons we're colliding at the Large Hadron Collider have. So it means that out there in nature, there's some you know, naturally occurring system that's accelerating protons just as well, just as you know, effectively as the Large Hadron Collider is and dumping them into space. Um, we don't really, you know, maybe we should be surprised by this, but I guess if we can do it in the laboratory, then there's no reason nature can't do it all on its own. So like I said, we've got this one square meter target, thousands of, Cosmic rays are hitting it every second. Every day or so, one hits it with 10,000 times higher energy. But if we wait a year, that square meter will be hit by a cosmic ray with a million times more energy. And if you wait a million years, one will hit it with about a billion times as much energy. So this cosmic ray spectrum, it doesn't seem to end at any reasonable amount of energy. It just keeps going higher, higher and higher and higher. Um, to, to, uh, to date, the highest energy cosmic rays that we've ever observed have in the ballpark of a few hundred million giga electron volts of energy. To put that in perspective, that's about as much energy as uh, the kinetic energy of a major league fastball. So one particle, a proton or nucleus or something, is carrying as much energy in its motion as a whole baseball, which has 10 to the 25 atoms in it, all concentrated in that one particle, all in that one individual cosmic ray. So do physicists have any guesses for where these very high energy cosmic rays are coming from? Well, well, certainly like Victor Hess and his contemporaries didn't have the foggiest clue. They, you know, speculated, but they, they just couldn't picture any kind of realistic astrophysical scenario that would make all these particles reach the earth with so much energy. But as time went on, like people started to figure things out in the 1930s and 40s, like reasonable scenarios started to be put forward, like uh, Fritz Wicke and Walter Bodd in 1934 proposed that maybe supernovae might have something to do with this. Uh, these are big explosions of stars and maybe they would have the conditions to produce particles like this, they thought. In 1948, uh, Horace Babcock proposed that these, these cosmic rays might come from magnetically variable stars. Um, and like the details from paper to paper varied, but they all basically had the idea that there were magnetic fields out there that were somehow accelerating these cosmic rays. I mean, that's more or less what we do at particle colliders too. At the Large Hadron Collider, we use big magnets to accelerate protons. Um, something like that has to be going on out there in nature, um, even if we don't know exactly how that works. Then in 1949, the physicist Enrico Fermi wrote a really important paper called On the Origin of Cosmic Radiation, where he laid out kind of the minimum criteria you would need to make cosmic rays with a given amount of energy. So, you know, he kind of sketched uh, an idea, but like it, it's more general than his than than what he just described. But in his description, he, he pictured a big volume of space with a bunch of clouds that were magnetized. So when a charged particle would hit the cloud, they'd kind of bounce off it. And all these clouds are moving around in random directions. And what Fermi showed is that in an individual collision, a particle that might become a cosmic ray might either lose or gain energy. But on average, after colliding with many of these clouds, it would tend to come out with more energy than it started with. So over time, you could accelerate cosmic rays this way. So this really wasn't the right answer in the end. It turns out that Fermi's proposal was really inefficient. Like if you waited long enough, it could work, but it would be pretty sl much slower than it had to be to work. 
but it got people thinking. And by the 1970s, other astronomers had worked out variations of Fermi's idea that could be much more efficient. But instead of these magnetized gas clouds, they relied on moving shocks. Um, so picture some sort of central location, like maybe where a supernova explosion happens. And then surrounding it in all directions are, are, are shock waves that are passing through space. And these shock waves uh, strike particles. And every time the particle travels across a shock wave, it tends to gain a little bit of energy. And this mechanism can actually lead to very energetic particles, maybe explaining all or most of the cosmic ray spectrum that we observe. It's kind of reminding me of those things in like Mario Kart where you like, you know, the tracks where <laughs> they really accelerate forward. Well, yeah, I wonder, I, I wonder if that could be a, a, a good learning tool for uh, explaining Fermi acceleration. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we have this at least generic mechanism for cosmic acceleration in mind, but we really haven't talked in detail about the kind of specific places that this mechanism might play out, the kind of astrophysical objects that the cosmic rays might come from. And I would say in the 1970s, we still didn't know, but over the last few decades, quite a lot of evidence has accumulated in favor of the hypothesis that many of the cosmic rays are produced in these regions surrounding these stellar explosions called supernovae. So a big star collapses and explodes, and then um, it leaves behind something called a supernova remnant, which can persist for tens of thousands of years where these shock waves are going out in all directions, and those shock waves can accelerate particles. And it turns out that for the kinds of magnetic fields and, and other characteristics that are present there, you can accelerate particles to about a, a PEV of energy this way. Uh, so this is a million gig electron volts. So this is a pretty high energy. And I would say that it's very likely that these supernova remnants explain all of the cosmic rays we see up to that energy but it doesn't really get the whole job done. It gets us up to a PEV, but we, we observe particles um, coming from space, at least occasionally, that have much, much higher energies than that. So I think if you did a survey of cosmic ray physicists today, you'd find most of them, and, and including myself, uh, are pretty convinced that supernova remnants in the Milky Way, our own galaxy, are responsible for the at least the majority of the cosmic rays that we see up to about a PEV in energy. But at even higher energies, there's good reasons to think that supernova remnants can't do the job. First of all, the magnetic fields in the regions that, that surround supernova remnants are, are not really strong enough to accelerate particles to the highest observed energies. You can explain cosmic rays up to maybe a million GEV this way using supernova remnants, but these sources can't be responsible for the highest energy cosmic rays, these particles that are hundreds of billions of GEV in energy. And then another reason why these highest energy particles can't come from supernova remnants is they seem to come in, you know, more or less from all directions of the sky uniformly. And at the highest observed energies, you know, these particles are, have so much energies that they won't be deflected by magnetic fields at least very much. They should roughly travel in sort of straight lines through the universe. So if they were all coming from things in our own galaxy, like supernova remnants, then we should see them mostly coming from the direction of the plane of the Milky Way. And instead, they seem to come from all directions about equally. So whatever is responsible for the highest energy particles, they're almost certainly extragalactic. They're almost certainly... Uh, you know, well beyond the boundaries of our own Milky Way. So supernovae get us pretty high energy cosmic rays, but we've observed some cosmic rays that are even higher energy that don't seem to center on the Milky Way. So what could be the source of these cosmic rays? Well, we don't know specifically where these particles come from, but we can at least say some of the things that would have to be true about them if they are to make particles accelerate particles to such incredible energies. They have to be either in a place that's really compact, so really small volume of space, or they have to have really strong magnetic fields. And the stronger the magnetic fields are, the bigger the volume of space that could be responsible. But some combination of these two things have to work in concert if you're going to make particles as high as the high in energy as the highest energy particles we observe. So there are a lot of guesses about what kind of things might do this. 
Um, if I were to place a bet, I think I would pick a class of sources called active galactic nuclei. So these are really big black holes, millions or billions of solar masses in, in, in mass. So millions or billions of times as massive as the sun. And, and these are at the middle of most galaxies. Um, but a small fraction of those black holes are actively accreting matter from their environment. So matter is kind of falling in towards them, heating up the environment and doing a lot of vile, volatile and intense things, including potentially accelerating cosmic rays up to very, very high energies. These regions have both the very, very high magnetic fields you would need and um, are very compact. And, and those two things working together could possibly do the job. Another possibility is that maybe in these really colossal stellar explosions called gamma ray bursts, you could uh, accelerate cosmic rays to this sort of energy. Um, so these are kind of like uh, supernova immense on steroids, maybe bigger stars collapsing that could create gamma ray bursts, or maybe they're uh, the mergers of black holes or neutron stars with other kinds of compact um, objects. So like either way, these, these are enormous uh, you know, stellar explosions much bigger than ordinary supernova, and, and, and like those could potentially accelerate cosmic rays to the highest observed energies. So there are a lot of experiments being conducted right now um, to study cosmic rays in more detail. One that I think a lot about in my re research is an experiment called AMS, which is on the International Space Station. So AMS really makes incredibly precise measurements of cosmic rays of a lot of different types and a lot of different energies, but it's pretty small. After all, this is like something you can fit on the space station. So, you know, it's, you know, it fits in a room, right? And, and there just aren't enough cosmic rays at high energies for it to have any hopes of being able to measure many or any of those. So if you want to study the highest energy cosmic rays, you have to go to earth and you have to instrument huge, you know, swaths of land, you know, you know hundreds or thousands of, of, of kilometers and, and uh, either build a, a big array of detectors that, that, that detect the cosmic rays when they strike the Earth's atmosphere, or build telescopes that use to monitor that atmosphere with. Um, one, one of these experiments is called the Pierre Auger Observatory in Argentina, um, and it's one of the premier ultra high energy cosmic ray experiments, um, but there are a few others as well. These experiments are going to teach us a lot about cosmic rays and their, their origin, but if you really want a smoking gun, if you want to know for sure that cosmic rays come from a certain kind of source, I think you're going to ultimately want to see high energy neutrinos from those sources. So for example, if I were to one day definitively detect neutrinos with a lot of energy coming from an active galactic nuclei or from a gamma ray burst or something like this, you would also instantly know that those objects also make ultra high energy cosmic rays. Those neutrinos come from the collisions of those cosmic rays with matter or radiation. So if you could detect the neutrinos, you'd instantly know where the cosmic rays come from. That's one of the big motivating considerations for experiments like Ice Cube and other neutrino telescopes that we've talked about on this podcast before. Um, and I think all the pieces are there. I, I think if I had to guess, we won't have to wait that much longer before this situation gets resolved. Uh, neutrino astronomy has kind of grown to a point where it should finally be able to answer Hess's 120 year old question or whatever, 110 year old question of what are cosmic rays and where do they come from? Today's episode was produced and edited by me, Shalma Wegsman. My co-host is Dan Hooper, a professor of astrophysics at the University of Chicago and Fermilab. Dan is also an author and has written many books, including most recently, At the Edge of Time, Exploring the Mysteries of Our Universe's First Seconds. Thank you for all your support and for listening to our show. If you want to support us even more, you can subscribe to our Patreon, where you can ask us questions for exclusive Ask Us Anything episodes, as well as get the ad-free versions of our regular episodes. You can find our Patreon at patreon.com slash whythisuniverse. In a funny way, one of the first podcast episodes of anything I've ever listened to was the Radio Lab episode where they investigate like why this voting machine 
seem to malfunction and like change the number of votes okay. and like throughout the episode they figure out that it was actually a cosmic ray um no that, kidding like, flipped, uh, that flipped a bit and it was like i had no idea that's what the episode was going to be about it was just <laughs> i was like oh my god wow okay yeah um when was that oh it wasn't in the states it was in belgium and it was the election was in 2003 and i think this episode is from 2019 <laughs>